introduction. All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good morning, John. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. Uh, from the Students of Fairfax City, we're very grateful that John Diliberto accepted our invitation to a show. John, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, pleasure to be here. I've seen your, seen your uh, other recordings and interviews, so. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. John, let's go back to the beginning of your family. Were you born like in a, in a musical family? I mean, no, how no, did you, you perhaps begin taking piano lessons or guitar lessons like all the kids back in the day? No, no, I wasn't uh, forced to do anything. Uh, now, my family wasn't particularly musical, although we did have, you know, a, one of those console stereos that was in a colonial style cabinet. And uh, I remember my, my parents, they got it. They bought about five or six record albums. And that was pretty much all they ever bought. <laughs> but I started buying a ton, ton of records. You know, mm -hmm. my, my first album that I ever bought with my own money was a Beatles album called Something New, which was one of those albums that, you know, Capitol put together because of stuff that was didn't come in on the regular albums. You know, they always used to take the British albums, remove two tracks and release Correct. those. So the, yep. this album had all those orphan two tracks on it. Uh, that was my first album that I ever bought in 65. And I still have it. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and so I just started, so I'm a child of the British invasion. You know, I really came of age in the psychedelic era. That was when I really yeah. started, started seriously getting into music and, and exploring all those bands, you know, Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, Quicksilver Messenger Service, Pink Floyd, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, my first concert, was Jimi Hendrix in 1968. Man, amazing, man. Yeah, so <laughs> that set the wow. bar high. <laughs> wow, the first one, man. Yeah, with the original. Wow. What do you do after that, you know? What do you do after man. that? Well, you know, it's funny. I saw that concert, and you pre might appreciate this. The opening act was the Soft Machine. So that they went completely the over my head. I was yeah. 14. I didn't get what they were doing at all. Mm -hmm. complete, but then they became one of my favorite bands. Good for you, man. Yeah. yeah. Were you in any band like in high school? I was I mean, never in a band. I was never, never in a band. I picked up flute. Yeah. I was inspired by Jethro Tull and the Blues Project. Um, and I, I picked up flute and I started playing flute. And I could, you know, I could whip out a tall tune. But, you know, I never, in fact, I still have it right here. Uh, and I haven't played it in like years. Um, but yeah, but you know, I tried to do that, but I really realized my, my thing was being more of, um, even back then was being more of a curator of music and a journalist of music rather than right. being a musician. Got it. So eventually you finished high school, right? And your parents saw you, man, this, this kid like music, listen to a lot of music, he's spending all his money buying record. What yeah. we're going to do with you? Or you you, you knew back then, like, um, dad or mom, I want to follow like a music career. Or your parents tell you, no, go to medical school, go to engineering, forget <laughs> about you. You're not going to make any money. It's a crazy lifestyle. Or you have the choice to do what you no, want. No, no. There was, there was no career uh, uh, influence or, or, you know, idea that parents had. And I was playing football at the time. Yeah. So I went to college playing football. Yeah, good to for you. University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, at, uh, playing playing football, and uh, and you know that that that's then that's when I really started getting into music, and that's when I went to WXPN, my uh, sophomore year, and that was just mind exploding. So XPN, I don't know if you know it, it's still no, there. Of yeah, it's still there. It's quite a bit different. But we, when I got there, they had the progressive music show. Diaspar was was going. They had these uh, outside jazz shows, and I was really getting into a lot of jazz, a lot of avant-garde jazz. And so it, that was where everything was planted. I, I didn't learn anything at Penn. I learned everything at WXPN. Then you went uh, just. Picture the scenario: You went to a room where they have hundreds, thousands of records that you could yeah. 
lease and see for the first time. Who are, you know, ECM record label was very popular. ECM was just kind of starting when, when, yeah. when, when I got there, they were just yeah. starting. And I remember all those early ECM recordings, Mal Waldron, uh, Just Music, and then, of course, the really great stuff, you know, Taya Riptal, uh, Jan Gabarik, um, you know, it, that was, ECM was just, just incredible, the 70s and 80s. Oh, yeah. A boring, now, but back then they were pretty incredible. And, and I would see some of those, a lot of those bands were coming through Philadelphia. So I saw Jan Gabarik live. I, I saw Terry Riptal, one of the best electric guitar concerts I've ever seen. Terry Riptal with that trio, that they Sondra trio. Yeah. Uh, just amazing stuff. And I got to interview all those people as they were coming through at the station. I wish I had those interviews. I didn't, didn't save any of those interviews I did when I was at XPN. Uh, really? A lot of people, yeah. I just, I just didn't have that consciousness of saving things. I wasn't producing, you know, was, they, they would come in and we'd do it live on the air or yeah. live to tape and it would just go up like that on the air. Uh, my first interview was this group called Isotope. Yeah, I don't know. That? They're no. very obscure, uh, but they had Hugh Hopper from the Soft Machine. Oh, I got it. Yeah, so yeah. It was his, his group, essentially. It was a fusion group. Um, and that was my very first interview. And I was thrilled to interview Hugh Hopper because, as I said, I'd become a Soft Machine fan, especially with when Third came out. That, that one, that was the one that sealed the deal for me on Soft Machine. Um, so, yeah, it was very, very exciting. Very, very scared. But, you know, yeah, we, I interviewed so many jazz musicians and so many, so many rock musicians, Jean-Luc Ponty, Jan Hammer. Yeah. Uh, wow. God, it was just, just a ton and uh didn't save any of them don't have any of those interviews my god john you need to go back in your life man yeah. but that Somebody... but then but then we started this radio series called yeah. totally wired yeah yeah so that was in the 80s 80s so it's called totally wired artists and electronic sounds the initial concept was it would be electronic music yeah and we got we got a grant from i forget pennsylvania council on the arts pennsylvania humanities council some of the money yamaha and sequential circuits uh yeah. gave us some money and we 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 went to europe it was my first time going to europe we went to england paris southern southern france and germany all over germany and we had interviews with everybody it was like one day i'm interviewing depeche mode this is like 1982. so one day i'm interviewing depeche mode you know, they wow. had their first album out, uh, you know, and then a few days later, I'm interviewing Karl Heinz Stockhausen. <laughs> wow. And, you know, and then Klaus was the last interview we did on that trip, I remember. Yeah. Uh, the Tangerine Dream in Berlin. This is when the wall was still up and everything, you know, so that was quite a bit different. And we got everybody. It was amazing how many people we got uh, on, on, on that trip. All those interviews are... Are those interviews are I have, huh? those interviews are, oh, I, I have those interviews. I've got those, that raw tape still, and I have the programs, the totally wide programs. In fact, one of them, did it go up last week? Put up one of them last week in the podcast. Uh, yeah. Because uh, you got the Yasos one. Yeah. Yasos and Steve Halpern. So, so I put that one up because Yasos passed away. I mean, I would reproduce those now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put them up as they were. I mean, because I did those on just a four-track uh, tape machine, those first uh, season or two. It was just on a four-track, so I was like, boy. And, I mean, they sound really great for being on a four-track. And uh, so people can go to echoes.org to, in the second menu, I think it's interview, people can listen to that. Those not, not the correct. totally wired, but they can... No, not the totally no. wide. It's only the ones we've put up, and we've only put up one or two. Um, yeah. We'll have to do something with those at some point. Uh, man, man, that's a uh, man. I, I would love to listen to this stuff, man. <laughs> oh, man. I'm, well, we I'm, did uh, like 124 episodes. <laughs> wow. And then um, people, um, so let, before we go there, so you, you knew back then that that's what 
that you wanted to do in your life? I, I mean, music related stuff, but maybe yes. broadcast, maybe broadcast interview with how you make a living at the time. You it was it was you couldn't figure out a way to make a living doing that. We, right? we made we made a living at it. It wasn't a good living. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we did, we did, we did make a living at it. You know, we were, like I said, we were getting grant money. We were getting money from, from, uh, some corporations. So this is back in Totally Wired. And yeah. then we turned, Totally Wired went right into Echoes in 1989. Yeah. Uh, went right into Echoes. And that we got a big grant, like I forget, $350,000 grant. Yeah. Uh, from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And we got a few more. We got like over a million dollars from them over over a couple of years, and um, so so the, yeah, so the, we were able to make a living doing that. And we did we did other things too, but it was mostly that. Right, and then uh, feel free to there is uh, for people that don't know it's a subscription mechanism that people can you know pay for wow. on a monthly basis or yearly basis. Yeah, the subscription thing has been cool. So echoes online. Yeah. Uh, is is where people can stream our show. So we do 10 hours a week of yeah. radio. So we do mo essentially Monday through Friday, two hours each day. Yeah. So we're doing 10 hours a week. So people can, can uh, Echoes Online, it's a subscription, but mm -hmm. people can stream those shows on demand. Plus there are other streams up there. There are exclusive like streams up there of, of uh, some different things. Um, so they can get all those stuff. The interviews that we do, those are available for free in the podcast. Um, uh, and the concerts that we do are also available for free, uh, on the website or on the app and the yeah. app is free. The, the what, app. what kind of, what kind of concert I have, I have not checked that portion yet. Oh God. What kind of concerts we, well, we used to do these things called living room concerts, right? Yeah. Okay. And the concept was we would go to a musician's home. This is the initial concept. We would go to a musician's home. They would invite people over and play a concert for them. We would record it as a radio show. Wow. Um, so we did the first batch of concerts. So it should be, excuse me. This would be 19, this would be 1989 still. The first batch of concerts was, I remember, it was a trip to California. We did. Steve Roach, Patrick O'Hearn, Mark Isham, uh, somebody else. But that was the first that was the first batch of concerts that we did. And so we, we just started doing those and we've God, we've had so many amazing people on the show. Lorena McKennett. Wow. Um uh, who else? Um Roger Eno, that was wild. Um, wow. And not Brian, though, but I've interviewed Brian yeah. several times. Yeah. Um, uh, Ian Body, several times. Mark Shreve. Yeah. Wow. Several Big times. Names, right? A solo with Ark, uh, with Redshift. Um, uh, Steve Roach, several times. Robert Rich, many times. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they would, it's funny, George Winston. So, in it, so we got rid of the audience thing because it was like asking the musicians too much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Sure, play, sure. play live for us for free <laughs> and, and also throw a party while you're at it, you know, it was some fun parties, but, uh, but we stopped doing that. So we just started doing them in their homes and then we started doing them at my house as well. And, uh, you know, we had George Winston in my house twice. You know, wow. the piano in, so which pretty much filled my living room. And George, George played in my house twice. Uh, Michael Hedges, uh, a lot of the Wyndham Hill people, in fact, came came through my house. Uh, Radio mm -hmm. Massacre International, um, uh, Otmar Liebert, um, uh, Jesse Cook. God, it was just it's just so many. It's, it's, I, I haven't counted up how many concerts we've done. Or in our interviews, the interviews are in the thousands, multiple thousands. The concerts are in the, it could be approaching a thousand. It's, it's been, it's been a lot of concerts, um, over the years. Yeah. But that's audio or audio and video both. You know what we've, we have shot video for some of them, but we usually just do audio. Um, 
we don't have the wherewithal, the money to put together something that would look good. Professional, right? right? Yeah, yeah. You know? And I, I see what people are doing now and, and you know, it's, I just don't want to put up something that that's, you know, does, doesn't look great. So we kind of just concentrate on the audio right now. And how those musicians, you, they were getting paid? I mean, with the grant that no, you got? No, they do it for so free. What will be the motivation for George Winston or, or you know, to go fly to your house, the living mm -hmm. room, rent a piano for six hours a day? And if they are not going to be making, how they will, what would the investment for them, right? The return on investment. Publicity, publicity. They're going to be on a national radio show. Right. It's on like a hundred stations. You know, one time oh, we were on, one time we were on 350 stations. Wow. You know, in the, in the nineties. Uh, for free publicity for them. Yeah. 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 So it was for the, for the publicity. I don't, uh, you, you must have great story about that. Those, uh, living room <laughs> concerts. What the, the worst thing that happened, or the, the crazy stuff that you can remember that, God, the worst. that you are, are willing and being able to share <laughs> with the, with the, with our audience here. Trying to think, there hasn't been too many tragedies. Uh, and oh, then the tragedies more on our ends, like, like we're on a plane going yeah. out to California. Mm -hmm. Jeff, Jeff Town, my producer, and I, are, and, and uh, we're going to record a bunch of concerts. And we, I say, so you brought the mics, right? Yeah. No, didn't you bring the mics? Oh. <laughs> so we had no mics. So fortunately, we got them from, um, oh, God, who was it? It was a, uh, the engineer and producer who did all the Hearts of Space album, Olsen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, he, he, gave, he gave us a, bun a bunch of his mics, really good ones, too, uh, to, you, to use on that trip. Uh, so that, that was kind of a tragedy. Uh, we've had actually the worst one was John McLaughlin, <clears throat> who I've interviewed John on the show many times, okay. and this time it was with uh, Remember Shakti, and yeah. they were supposed to play live for us. We were going to go up to New York where they were, and they were supposed to play live for us. And they they just were on on the turnpike going up, and the pr promoter calls up and says, "They say they can't play live." somebody needs to go out and get something in their instrument fix. I think they just didn't want to play live. So that was, that was, that, that was the one that really ticked me off. We didn't still did an interview with them. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, that was not, not fun. Ravi Shankar, same thing. Uh, we're going to record Ravi Shankar in New York and his <laughs> wife got sick. I think she just had a cold and uh and it was like a big tragedy for the family or something and he couldn't possibly record i remember being in the room and the tabla player and 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 the uh, tambora player are sitting there waiting for ravi to come on you know on the stage where we we're gonna uh, in, uh record them and yeah <laughs> ravi just never showed up <laughs> yeah so hundred of as you say thousand of concert and then and then the interview amazing man that if you ask me John every, every, all the stuff need to be upload easy for me to say but uploaded and share or either in echoes and and Facebook for people like you and I and thousands of listeners all the world to like good music to see the stuff because that's a treasure that's like I told you at the beginning my my motivation when I started the radio was to create in many ways um, an archive for future generation. I'm not only for the money. You know, I buy a lot of music. I love, uh, I see uh, 60 shows a year. And I do what I do because I'm passionate about music and I want to share that with my son and future generation. Hopefully, you know, the world will be, we won't kill ourselves and the, the internet will be around. And I want to, many ways, share music, interview, concert with the rest of the world, man. It, uh, you know, music has given me so much satisfaction in my life. It's hard to describe. Well, my, I grew up, I told you before, in Chile, and uh, my dad had a lot of music, a lot of music, a jazz, jazz, all jazz. And then tango. So I began listening to music when I was a baby. That's what my dad told me. 
78 RPM and different big trollers at home. And and then when I was 14, I discovered rock and roll. And that's why I said, man, I need to fly to the United States. I need to see this band. You know, no internet, no phone. You would buy a, you know, Tell your dream album and open it up. Who are these people? How they can sound this stuff? You know, what are keyboards? What are oscillators and so forth? So, it's a it's a beautiful thing, man. So it was. Um, looking back in your life, you you did what you wanted to do. Many ways. When I look back on my life, I can't believe how fortunate I've been. It's just like yeah, I I, I have friends who are millionaires now, and they say we wish we wish we were, could do what you did. But I wish I could be a millionaire, but <laughs> in the answer lies in between, right? Yeah, but you know, but yeah, it's it's just amazing the life I've had and and the musicians I've met, and you know, some of them become friends, and that that's been good. Especially, it was very cool. Like so, when I started, mm. most of the people we were, I was interviewing were older than me, right? Yeah, of course. There yeah. were people who were you know they were a generation. All, all, older than me but as time yeah. goes on i started interviewing people who were my generation Got it. So that's yeah. when steve roach and robert rich right and, Shri, and all these people became friends like good friends yeah uh, and because we all had the same background we had all been listening to the same music exactly yeah. uh, it, it, and so we could, had all that to share and then we we're sharing mm -hmm. what they were doing and mm -hmm. evolving evolving that music and uh and so that was, that was just an amazing time when the, when that when that happened. And then as I moved on, now I'm interviewing people who are like way younger, the, like younger than my kids now. Yeah, you know my kids are are like in their thirties, early thirties. Um, but I'm interviewing people sometimes that are like in their early twenties. You know, it's, yeah. it's just it's just just amazing because there's still new people making like incredible music. Right. Absolutely. You mentioned Steve Roach and uh, uh, Rob Rich. Both are great people, great human beings, but both, man. Both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's amazing. There anybody who had denied an interview multiple times uh, you, and you ping them every year. And then after five years, they say, yeah, or maybe they never say. <laughs> they got to be named you know, people. It, it's funny. Um, no, nah, not, there's, there's not really. Not really. You know, I was yeah. lucky to just get all these people, especially early on, which I still can't believe, you know, because we were a nothing show in the beginning. The show was yeah. happening. And we were getting all these, all these like ma major people. You know, the most frustrating one has been Brian Eno. And I interviewed, I've interviewed Brian Eno like about six times, but I haven't interviewed him since 2003. Hmm. And I've, I've just not been able to get an interview with him. And I've tried multiple times. And, and they were all good interviews. In fact, he would ask me for copies of the interviews. They were all good interviews. And, and he enjoyed them. Uh, I thought they were the, some of the best interviews I've done. And, uh, and now I, I just I just can't access them anymore. And I've, yeah, been trying, I've been trying to get Bill Nelson. Yeah. Are you following him? Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, he. Oh man, the guy's been putting out an album a month for five years. That's right. Yeah, literally, and they're all really good. It's just like I just can't believe how much music this guy and I've interviewed him before too but now I can't get him to deal with the tech to do what, like what you and I are doing right now yeah because uh, I need him to record his side we we have them re people re record with like real microphones and stuff not yep. computer mics yeah correct yeah yeah so so but now but the, the majority will will say yes I mean feel free to elaborate well, how the how the echoes is a, like you said before it's a daily to our music soundscape, how this tribute to PRX? What's the relationship between PRX and and hundreds of radio stations all the world? They need to they need to pay like a fee. How you, you pay, produce pay, an, pay. you produce two hours, right? How how the two hours goes to all these radios and well, technically it's all internet now. It used to be satellite, and yeah. Uh, and yeah, they the the P, PRX charges them a fee. Yeah, they take a percentage of it. Yeah, PRX, and we get the rest. We get most of it, um, yeah. and that—that's how how that works. Yeah, they're they're our distributor. 
No, I got it. And then are so what about a new radio out there that is not part of the, you know, PRS network? How can you know, network can join and start? Well, uh, anyone, anyone can join yeah. and, and, and yeah, join your program. Yeah, anyone can join PRX. I don't, I don't think that's a lot of money. Um, and then, yeah, then they just have to subscribe. So, like any any station could do it, any you know terrestrial station. You're you're just on the internet, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So any terrestrial station, even a commercial one, could do it. We don't have any. We've, I don't think we've ever had any. Um, but uh, but any any public station, yeah, I can definitely definitely get it. And that's that's the way you kind of able to keep on going and, and find yeah. out, right? Yeah, well, right now, it, it, right now it's, a, it's about half and half. Online subscriptions and yeah. radio, and radio um, members, subscribers. That that's, that's about half and half of the money we make. I got it. And um, what about, uh, you know, going to be companies that look at, you know, echoes that program and say, man, hundreds of thousand people are listening to this music yeah, the, uh, that, that, that whole thing that whole thing has not been good the underwriting thing we call it yeah. underwriting in public underwriting, radio. right yeah yeah sponsorships we've not been successful doing that and uh it's pa it's partially that we've never had a sales person or team to do that mm -hmm. and um and it, it's yeah it's something that we've we've missed out on um you know, we do have some labels. Spotted Peccary has been a really big supporter over the last several years. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there's a few other, a few other labels and it comes in occasionally, but yeah, it, it's something that's out there for us to pursue and we haven't pursued it. Because for all the YouTubers out there, right? Uh, that's what they, you know, a, a channel became popular and then, yeah. you know, XYZ brand when I put an ad with them and then they get a percentage, a commission or whatever. Right. They, right. That's what they find out. And stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But then we, we need to do that in a big way. And it's just, we're only three people who work on the show. Yeah. Uh, me, my producer and my office manager who essentially ties everything together. Um, and you know, handles, handles, listeners and handles you know subscribers so it's, just, it's only three people not none of whom are inclined to be salespeople, <laughs> and i feel like i can't be the salesperson you know i just I, it's just something about it that feels wrong for me to be the salesperson uh so yeah it's something that we need to rectify how long does it take a, a two-hour program to put, you know, uh, because there are hundreds of albums out there, there's yeah. hundreds of tracks out there, new stuff, you know, Robert Rich, uh, yeah. the new people. Um, well, as, as you know. So how you put together, how you decide, you know. Uh, well, the auditioning is is the, <laughs> one of the longest things to do, as, as you probably know, mm. uh, especially now that it's all pretty much downloads, right? Mm. So yeah, we, it's just unbelievable. But, but to actually put a show together, it takes me about, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes to actually put a show together, put all the music in. Then it takes me another hour or so to write it and do the show prep for it. Then it takes me, you know, you'd be surprised. I, I, I do, I only talk about 12 minutes in two hours. So it takes me about 12 minutes to 15 minutes to record my voice tracks for the show. And then Jeff, my producer, assembles the voice tracks with the music I've put together. And that, that takes him a couple of hours. Then it's out. The thing that's time consuming is the features. So you've heard the features, right? Yeah, 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 correct. Yeah. So you can, they're very intricately produced. They're very heavily edited. I mean, you know, you hear a 15 minute feature and that that's called from an hour plus interview usually. Um, and so the, the writing and the, and the editing and the mixing, all of that 
takes, you know, a feature. We, I can't believe we used to do four to five features a week, four to five a week. That's a lot of work, man. That's unbelievable. I can't believe we used to do it. And that was yeah. before digital. That was, we're doing it on an eight track machine mm -hmm. and, and reel to reels. That was, you know, in those yeah. first few years. Yeah. And now, you know, we have all, of course, all the workstations and stuff and, and it's much, much faster, but yet we're only doing, we only do one a week now because they did just so time because and that of course doesn't include actually doing the interview doing the research for the interview course, you know, yeah. the, the research could take days for for a particular interview some sometimes less depends who it is brian eno's days other people not less um and uh yeah so that takes it's it's a it's a lot of time it's it's very time consuming if I'm, for me every time i interview I do research because I want to do a good interview and ask interesting questions. So mm -hmm. it's not a trivial that people say, well, you know, you talk to whatever John Doe and it's only one hour. No, it takes me a lot longer. And I, I work full time as well. So the early day, early morning, late nights, yeah. put them together. Well, working a full time job and then doing that is, is a lot of work. Yeah, you're, but, you're, 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 you're a passionate man. Oh, I do. And, uh, <laughs> uh you know a couple of times or many times actually i i interview people but i got over the world so i needed to i don't know talk to uh lisa gerard right for that can in australia mm -hmm. uh, we did the interviews at one two in the morning and another one i did it like a four thirty in the morning my wife would say why you work were you why are you waking up at four in the morning? <laughs> oh, I need to I need to interview Lisa Gerard. Who is she? Of course she wouldn't know. So and and some people in Japan, 1 a.m. I need to wake up at six o'clock in the morning. So I'm I'm really passionate about this stuff. I I really I meant what I said to you before about that, but, you know, I I really wanna, you know, create like a music legacy of all of them. Like you, I wanna look back in my life. One day I said, man, I saw the best of the best. I, you know, I interviewed the best of the best. I was, I have a beer with uh, Manzanera, with the Roxy Music guy, or Eric Clapton, or this or that, the Tangent Ring guy, you know, either when they were sick or something. And I, talked to him, I, said, I can die happy one day, man, you know, so. Did you interview uh, Eric Clapton? No, not yet. Uh, <laughs> okay, not, <laughs> not yet, right? Yeah, but but no, I will. I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm going. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be flying to London a couple of times this year, and um, oh. and uh, he's playing at the Royal Albert Hall in mid-May. I'm going to see him there, and I'm working with a couple of people I know here to see if I can do him and uh, do an interview at the Royal Albert Hall. And uh, Steve Hackett, he's doing doing the group be doing the Lamb, the Genesis oh. in October, and I'm flying there as well. I'm going to be interview him inside the royal over hall so and uh yeah, see steve's a good interview he's, he's a, a good, he, he's a he's a very nice person man yes yeah, an amazing guitar player and and i do everything on my own i'm i'm a one-man show so yeah you know if i screw up or this is completely my fault i don't have anybody <laughs> and i finance everything how you how you go about um you guys don't buy the music you kind of live on the music you're able we pay we pay we pay all the fees so we're paying we're paying so that's for the online stuff for radio we don't have to do anything right that's taken care of by uh national public radio and uh, you know that this all the stations pay a fee in right. a blank a blanket fee so any music that they play is covered it's core for that yeah it's covered you know they're paying it's already paying something for it so we don't have to do that but for the online yeah we have to pay ASCAP BMI yeah. uh CSAC uh and okay. uh and we have to pay into sound exchange so so yeah so online we have to pay all those fees are fairly minimal because we're you know as an online thing we're ain't, we're not Spotify we're right <laughs> you sure. know yeah and then how you select the difficult thing is how do you select the music that the two hours you say you're thinking about a program tomorrow tomorrow Tuesday, right yeah i don't it, think that way huh? <laughs> this is what i do i go in i have my library i use itunes to organize the library yeah and i go in and i use hindenburg program to put put it together 
and I drag tunes into the bins. And I have the bins divided up, vocals, electronic, acoustic, and special. And uh, so I'll drag the tracks into those individual bins. And then I just start dragging them into the session. And, you know, if you've listened to the show, we're, we're very uh, diligent about our segues. Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, so, in fact, it's, a, it's kind of a source of pride. This is something that goes all the way back to XPN. Um, and so I, I, I essentially pick the music as it flows together. So there'll be some things I say, I'm going to get to this track, I'm going to get to this artist, and then I'll build the set around, around that. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's, that's essentially how I do it, how, they, how they're sounding together. And then I have things on my mind. I don't want to play... I don't play electronic tracks back to back. I don't play, you know, acoustic guitar tracks back to back. I'm always trying to create a flow where those things are, you know, ebbing and flowing in and out of out of the mix. Yeah, because it's a lot of it's a lot of work to put that together. Yeah. Because there are so many great albums out there, so many great tracks. How you select a particular track, and you say you have a set of rule, right? Not to electronic music back to back and you know and this or that they, they got a set of rules to to implement at a two hour podcast which is a lot of work to man you know? yeah and feel free to elaborate on people that don't know the the star end in the, what there was 75 and 76 i believe stars and yes i think it was 75 we were yeah. all, all a little hazy on the exact start date uh, but yeah. i would have still been in school at that time yeah and, um And I started with this guy, Steve Pross, who became kind of a record producer. He started a label. He's out in L.A. now. He, he went off and was heavy into punk. <laughs> he went from stars on to punk. Um, but we started the show together. And that was that was because Diaspar, the progressive show, that was a very high energy show. Yeah. But we had all the spacey stuff coming out. You yeah. Know? So we decided to create this show that would just be all that spacey stuff. So it was from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Sunday morning. Uh, and it's I can't believe Chuck Van Zyl, man. I mean, I did it up until the mid 80s. And then there, there were people would alternate. There were three or four hosts uh, that, would, that would alternate because, you know, those hours were not great hours. Um, and then Chuck took it over and he became the soul guy doing it. And he's, he's maintained it. He's main faith, maintained fidelity to the original concept. Um, and he's created something very cool around it. He does that show. He does the concert series. I don't, don't yeah. probably come yeah, up. I'm familiar with Chuck. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, he cre- created that, uh, you know, my, Jeff town, my producers involved with those, Uh, so it's just it's extraordinary. That show is still going. It has a really good audience. Um, I'm almost envious of the, the loyalty of their audience, to be honest with you. And uh, yeah, I, that's, it's, it's very cool that something I started is still still going. What, yeah. years later? Almost, almost, uh, almost 50. Almost 50, 50. years. Jeez. But- Wow, <laughs> it's amazing. But as the hour are early in the morning, I think it was either Sunday early morning or Sunday early morning. Sunday early morning. You know, you just, I'm sorry to interrupt your thought, but you just made me think, I've been doing radio for 50 years this year. Man, you got to go out with your wife and celebrate, man. <laughs> Jesus, I got to do something about that. <laughs> yeah. I just realized, I mean, that, that's the thing. We, we're never conscious, conscious of any importance of our own thing. Like early on, we are horrible at taking pictures. Yeah. We interviewed all these people. Most of them, we don't have pictures. And these My are face, face interviews, you know, not like remote interviews, right. face to yeah. face interviews. And, and cause we, yeah, that wasn't our mind. No, we were there to do the interview and get it, you know, pictures that wasn't even a thought. Wasn't even yeah, a thought. Sure. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Taking, creating like an audio to transcript and then create like a book, but you don't, you don't have I pictures. Have, I have, and um, I just haven't been able to sit down and do it. Of course, a lot of work, right? So. I haven't been able to sit down and do it. And I, w- I would need to know, uh, you know, this is kind of, um, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe crass is the word. But I would need to know there was some money involved to make me give up all that time. 
<laughs> to write the book. And I'm not sure there's going to be money involved. I've talked to some publishers. Yeah. Uh, and and there, there, there was interest. And I just couldn't sit down to even write, you know, an overview or anything. It's just, it's, it's just such, at this point, it's such a big thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would, to, I would need to hone it down into something smaller. You know what I mean? Like the Cal, the California electronic scene, you know, or yeah, yeah. You know, German space music or, or something, you know, smaller. Um, but I just, the, the oh. show takes up so much time. Well, big, and I'm big, big top 100 interviews. You know, this is the best. According to John Deliberto, this is the best 100 interview I have yeah, done. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, that, that, need... that concept, I, that would be the easy concept. And yeah. it's not quite that interesting to me to just have the transcripts of the interviews as the book. I don't know why I feel like I need to be in there saying something. I need to create a context. You know, I, w- I want to write a book. I don't know, I'm trying, trying to think of some good books. I'm never good at coming up with stuff off the top of my head. Um, this guy did the Pink Floyd book like about 30 years ago. Um, shoot. Get the- you're talking about hypnosis or yeah it wasn't hypnosis it was a book about tangerine dream yeah and this uh, writer was just an incredible writer yeah and uh and I, and I don't know why it's escaping my mind right now um but you know that's the kind of book i would i would i would want to do um i'm trying to think of any recent books yeah things aren't coming to mind right now but yeah very likely that will be any money you will do it for the love of arts i mean yeah, I don't know how many people will will buy the book. I don't know. Yeah, well, that's the problem. I mean, you you must have realized at this point that we, well, you yeah. and I were dealing with a very niche. Oh, kind absolutely, absolutely. Kind of thing. Right. Like you said, your wife says Lisa Gerard. Who? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I mean, you. I mean, and especially now, it's worse now than it used to be. I mean, you could say Brian Eno, and most people have no, no idea, idea what you're who he is. What's, what's your take, John, on the the, the Spotify? Well, the artists keep on complaining. For me, it's a great tool. I'm very selfish because uh-huh. I pay ten bucks a month. You're right. I'm able to listen to a lot of me. I buy a lot of music, obviously, but I I listen to a lot of music. They make music recommendation and then and I put the stuff together. I discover a lot of music. It's great. If you're a musician, it's terrible. You have to you need to have a million hits to make 10 bucks 20 bucks a month it's that's, a, that's a ripoff so what's the answer I, it's i hear i hear different things though i hear some musicians and not big ones like robert rich right right he's kind of he's kind of happy with the money he's making from that yeah he, he thinks he's making like a, a nice nice sum of money from spotify and the other other streaming services so right. i've heard that from from many people and then there's other people like sam rosenthal from project I know is really anti, uh, anti Spotify. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a, it's a little dice. I think they should all be making more money, but then you'd be paying more than 10 bucks a month. <laughs> That's right. Well, or, 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 or different layers in between or management. I think uh, the, the creator need to get paid more. Mm-hmm. They, they gotta be, I, I suppose, I assume that, there are many managerial fees in between, and everybody want to take a cut. Yeah, and then you know the the artists get paid of zero point zero zero one four cents for every track, right? It should be a lot more, right? So yeah, yes, it, sh- it should be. It, it 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 is crazy, but I tell you, like you, I use Spotify all the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll listen to something on Spotify instead of going to get the CD. You know. Yeah. To- it's just so so easy and for research it's great for research it's great <laughs> the same with you know band band camp is i think it's very fair because they only take 10 percent and the 90 percent go to a musician so whatever Robert, yes. Robert rich when i put an album there he'll get 90 cents of a dollar right and and Bandcamp camp only take 10 cents which i think is very very fair right so, yes band camp is is really fantastic i mean yeah. and i love getting music that way too yeah I, yeah. If you can send me a download, send me a send me a yum code on Bandcamp, yeah. you know, uh, that then I can download you know a wave or an AIF file, 
and, yeah. and too easy, you know, it's so easy. That's right. How big is your music collection? Yeah. You don't want to know. <laughs> okay, I've got a ballpark. I've got you about have several stereo about, about 60,000 CDs. Oh my gosh. And about 4500 vinyl. Yeah. Um I purged, I recently purged my collection. I purged yeah. 6000 CDs out of it. They're mo mostly jazz because I was on a lot of jazz lists and you know I would just get the stuff and I realized, you know, I just not listening to it, just not into that guy. Um, I purged a lot of them. I sold them for a thousand dollars, six thousand yeah. CDs for a thousand dollars. Wow! Hold on, let me turn my turn on my phone. And then, so th those are um, the stuff that you had bought, or the record label has sent you, or, or, or oh, the, the stuff that was purged was almost all sent to me. Oh, I got it. Yeah, all yeah. sent to me. Yeah, yeah. No stuff I bought. I no. I don't. I don't think any thing I bought was in that purge. I got it. And uh, you, you, you go back. So first, stupid question: Why your wife hasn't has not divorced you with you know all she the space it. that you have, bathroom, living room, attic, this or that? I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a picture. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna send you a picture of oh part and part of my library. Of cool. part because I can't send you the whole thing. It's it's the whole bit. We have a big basement. It's yeah. a whole, whole almost the whole basement. Yeah, and I have storage a storage unit. Actually, all the Echo stuff is in storage now since um since COVID, and we shut down our studio. And I'm working. You don't. You, this is my home right now. Cool. Yeah. yeah, and um, so 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 you know most of it's on a hard drive here. Sure. Uh, but the CDs are, are all in storage in a unit. And it's like a big unit. It's like 10, 10 by 30. This is a 30 foot long row of CDs in cabinets. You still buy music? You go on Saturday, on Sunday, go to record nah, store? Almost and never. Then... Almost never. No? Almost never. I only buy old stuff. Uh, you know, Online, so, eBay yeah. or Amazon. I mean, or if I'm using it on the show. Yeah. And I get it somehow, and I need it. I will buy the CD because I want to have that audio quality. Sure. So I will, I will buy. I will buy the CD, um, which is getting harder to do too. You know, fewer and fewer people are buying stuff, and the yeah. cars nowadays, new car now they don't have a CD player. Well, my car doesn't have one. No, nope. no, nope. unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of changes in our lives, Claudio. And for me, I buy a lot of vinyl and I buy a lot of CDs. And of course, all my cards are not brand new, but, but I, if I didn't have a CD player, I wouldn't install one. That's what I'm paying a car for because music is is very important for my life. I listen to music, John, two, at least two hours a day. At least two hours. I don't listen to radio that much, but listen to my old stuff. I'm buying a lot more uh, albums and vinyl, CD, Blu-ray, they're able to consume, so they pile out. So I go to a record store, usually go every once a month. Uh, well, I'm always buying for eBay or Discog or Amazon, but I go to a, 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 a store that usually I go, they have good deal, good prices, I will buy 50 vinyl, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're piling there on the floor over there, and then listen to this and then get another 50 or another 100. And so I'm always buying and consuming, listening. So I couldn't live my life without it. So when I'm driving to any play, I need to have a CD play because I'm buying a lot more stuff than I'm able to consume. So I need to listen to stuff, you know, <laughs> because it's important for my life, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get it. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to music all, like all, all the time. Um, you know? Well, usually I'm auditioning music, which is not always a great experience, as I'm sure sure you know. <laughs> yeah, of course not. How how people can a, a new musician out there in the world can have his or her music in your show? They they need to fill like a form, send you a sample. No, just send it. Just send it. Just send it. it's it's all. There's instructions on the website. 
you just just hit the contact thing and it says music submissions and just follow follow that it's very simple you don't need a promoter you don't need a record label uh, you don't you don't need anything i'm out list i'll listen to pretty much anything that comes in i'm not i don't care where it's from you know how big they are uh which is you know a problem because <laughs> they're not big so it's it's funny you maybe you've noticed this when you have a really big artist on your show you get many, many more hits than when you have you know someone like me <laughs> no but you know this stuff, yeah. no but you know you know your stuff and you know your stuff but i listen to a lot of i mean it, it depends on the day and the hour and you know what i'm doing but uh jazz rock electronic music stuff from the 80s all the big name obscure name film score i have i don't know like 600 or at least and i'm going to be interviewing a lot of film composer i have and i'm going to be interviewing um uh some movie directors as well that know a lot of the music oh. i want to yeah i want to see how um you go and see a movie, you know, like Oppenheimer or Napoleon nowadays or Ferrari, right? To mention the three, three um, big ones nowadays. And um, you like the music. I'm sorry, you like the movies and the, the music, the film score is in the background, right? And I want to know how they end up selecting the music to match a particular thing. Mm -hmm. uh, um you know, for example, um, a composer could be uh, Marcello de Francisci and Lisa Gerard putting the music for Ferrari nowadays, right? And um, they've written, you know, 12 track. Uh, in the movie, I only saw or heard eight. What happened with the other four? How will somebody pick, you know, those eight out of the 12 to be selected of a particular scene? And they pick only like, 10 seconds out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many rejected score, right? Uh, that movie director say, well, the music is always put toward the end, right? 90% of the movie, and then they use fake music, right? To particular scene, and then they need to hire a composer to write the music for the film, right? And there are many scores that are rejected that didn't go to the movie. A good example with a big the exorcist before, you know, uh, the director picked tubular bells, right? Mm -hmm. What happened to the stuff? That's fascinating for me. Um, um, he said he would have used Tangerine Dream in The Exorcist if he'd known who they were at the time. If they would have, yeah, they, he didn't know at the time. Would, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's um, how you, uh, how were you able to get a, a hold of uh, Edgar Frosty? Now that I'm done with talking about the interview, I, you that's know, a fascinating guy. He, unbelievable. I've, I, I, I've, inter I've interviewed him. Maybe ten times. I mean, yeah. I I I, I heard the, the interview, the first one they did in like eighty two. I believe it was. The yeah, that was, that, was was. On a, that was on that. Very trip very Florida. humble guy, very unassuming guy. You know, quiet guy. And why yeah. don't you have video to begin with, man? Why didn't I video? Yeah, come uh, on, man. I, oh, back, I back like then. Visual, man. Back then, video in eighty two, video wasn't an easy thing to do. You recall? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we so used to technologies on phone and cameras that right. <laughs> so you, you go ahead, go ahead. No, no, but you asked how I, it's. I don't know how I, I probably got in touch with him through the record label. That's probably through Virgin. Yeah, the, the, the one of the interesting ones was Stockhausen. So I, call, I called up his record label and said, can you give me Carl Heinz Stockhausen's phone number so I can call him for an interview? He said, oh, no, we, we can't give out his phone number. I'm, I'm sorry, but but we can, we can give you his address and you can send him a letter. Yeah. So he gave me the address. I called information, <laughs> got yeah. his phone number and called him. Oh. <laughs> and he was great. You know, he's, I, I still can't believe I interviewed him. That's like, that was one of the most, you know, terrifying interviews in preparation for it. Because the yeah. guy's, guy's a genius. Yeah. Guy's, you know, and his music is amazing. And, you know, he's so, so conceptual and so kind of mystical and, and also has this technical side. 
and he's also a German <laughs> and you know, all that that goes along with it. And uh, yeah, my one of my favorite ones was Holger Shukai. He was yep. such a sweet guy. He was so sweet, man. He spent the whole day with us. He took us out to eat, took us out to dinner. We we hopped on hopped on the trolleys without paying. I said, "Don't we have to pay?" So, "No, no, you don't have to pay." <laughs> he was just you know, this crazy guy. I remember going in. So this is before digital, right? Yeah. I remember in his house, he had an aerial antenna. You know, and it was a big one with a lot of I figure tines on them, mm. and he had all these tape loops hanging from them. That you know he'd been using to to create create his music because his music was all tape manipulation, right? Yeah. Ah, uh, he he was he was definitely one of my f- most most fun interviews. I interviewed him I think three times. Too bad he he passed a while ago. He was pretty old for all those guys. He was. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of Rodelius lately because today we're running an interview with Tim Story. Yeah. And and Rodelius is in it because I interviewed him. To, I've interviewed him a few times, but I interviewed him twenty twenty, and uh, so he's in in this in this feature that's going to run today. And uh, I'm thinking, wow, he's he's going to be ninety this year. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, it's amazing. Yeah. Man. He was older than all those all those other musicians, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm thinking of that. All these musicians get getting getting so like. Uh, you know Sun Ra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. Yeah. Marshall Allen. He's yeah. going to be 100 this year. And he's yeah. still, still I've around. Seen, I've seen him. He's still he's still playing live. And he's yeah. still, like, pretty amazing. And he's, like, you know, coordinating this whole orchestra thing. It's like, whoa. 100. How, how often do you bring people? I mean, if, like you say, Brian Eno. Uh, every five years, you have, like, a list of, you know, they... Bring them back to do a follow-up interview. Uh, no, I usually pretty much do it as they're putting out stuff. I'm, I gotta say, most of the interviews we've done have been, you know, happened because they had a new release out. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, one of the funniest ones of that was uh, I interviewed Lou Reed. Yeah, wow. Because Lou Reed, um, here I actually have this. Um, so obviously, we don't play Lou Reed on the show. We're not that yeah. kind of show. Of course not. Yeah, uh, but you know, I I like his music. I respect the stuff he's done over the years. He's married to Laurie Anderson, which is always a good thing. We have played her on the show a lot. Yeah. Uh, but he put out the, this album, this Hudson River Wind Meditations. Yeah. Wow. Have you? Do you know this? No, I don't know that album. Oh, I, oh. I know, I it's a pure. Know. It's purely ambient. I mean, pure, purely ambient. And um, I need to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, wow, you know, what a good excuse to interview Lou Reed, right? Because I could never interview him and have, you know, on his other music on the show. So that's I right. did this interview with him. It was great. They actually used part of That's a reissue that just came out this week. Yeah. Um, and that, so they, they've reissued it and they used some of my interview in the, in the liner notes. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's how things kind of come up, you know? Eno usually had a new release. They're, they're almost, except for the first first couple of times, they, they were just interviews. He walked out of an interview once. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, I, I, I'll try and make the story short. So he he just launched Opal, right? And uh, and I forget what album he had out at the time on Opal. I think it was music for films too. Yeah. And. Um, and he was in LA and he was, so he's doing a round of interviews. He was doing like an on stage thing. I mean, it was just like nonstop media that he was doing. And that was right at the time from musician magazine. I don't know if you remember that, but they were a big deal at the time. I mean, they were almost as big as like Rolling Stone. And uh, so I was doing it for them as well as for, for totally wired <clears throat> or was it echoes? It was echoes. And, um, and so he, I, I remember saying to them, you know, I don't don't give me Brian after he's done a million interviews already. So of course that's what they did. So I'm sitting I'm sitting in the Warner Brothers office in, in L.A. Wait, waiting for him. He's he's doing another interview. He walks out of that interview, and goes, I'm done. 
I'm done. I can't do any more interviews. And I'm sitting there going. So it was about like an hour or two of them, like trying trying to coach Brian back into the room. So he finally comes back into the room, and it was just the funniest thing. He said, "I don't know what I'm doing here. This is not what I'm supposed to. Do. I feel like I've spoken every thought I've ever had. I feel like I've spoken this week." Yeah. <laughs> and he looks at this yeah. poster of Aha, and he says, Look, "I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't have anything to do with that." And and so finally, finally, I, I forget. I asked him some question. He says, "Okay, I, I'm I'm done. I can't do this anymore." He says, "He says I I I I'm sorry. I owe you a favor, and I will discharge it in the future." Yeah. <laughs> and he walked out, wow. and he did, he did like a couple of weeks later. We did a phone thing, and uh, and he was it was a great interview. It was the only yeah I've actually interviewed him on the phone a few times, but most of them have been in person. Um, he did a phone thing. It was great. And I interviewed him several times after that. But yeah, that was funny. The, you, a question, you have a, a big vinyl CD collection where every time you go to an interview, you bring five or six CDs for, for people to autograph from you. You have like a big... I don't do that. Really? I don't do that at all. Um, I feel like it's... Um, I, f I feel like there's, I f I'm a critic... You know, I've done a lot of writing, right? In, in yeah. like, you know, musician, Billboard, Pulse, Downbeat, Jazz is. I mean, in the not in the eighties and nineties, I was published somewhere every month. Got it. Yeah. I, so I feel like, as a critic, it, it kind of breaks a wall that I'm not sure I want. I want. I want to break. It, it turns me. Oh, so I'm now. I'm just a fan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. I don't, I don't know no, you know for what? me, I for me, I need to do that. Uh, I um, for my personal ego and my personal collection, and uh, I look at the picture, and uh, you know, because I'm not a critic, right? So I do the stuff that I do. I don't write for anybody, you know. I I do it because I like it. So looking, a good example would be, you know, I was listening to Tangerine Dream. In mm -hmm. 1976, my first vinyl record, right? Four years later, I have interviewed about 10 people from Daniel and Dream. I never interviewed Edgar Frost, but, you know, people from the early days, several, right? And I look back and say, remember that 76, I have an album for this guy. I just have a conversation with them. I went to see Daniel and Dream, you know, and they signed a couple of CD, CD, CDs, a vinyl, or the book, or whatever I have at the time, and I that I, I close like a loop, like a connection, making a connection for me. That's very very important, you know. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm not a critic, so I, so I, I'm I'm biased, right? Everybody's good to me, you know. You know, so <laughs> I, I see that. I see that. No, I, I definitely, I definitely see that. Um, the the la I think the last time I asked for an autograph, yeah. Was actually Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett. Wow. I got it from my. This is a funny story. So this is Totally Wired days. Yeah. Tony used to listen to Totally Wired in Chicago. We were on the radio in Chicago, and he used to listen to it. And he loved this one musician, Peter Michael Hamill. Yeah, of course I know who he is. Yeah. Uh, he he, lo he likes, it. and so I get a call saying, "I'm calling from the office of Tony Bennett. Can you take a call from him?" <laughs> <laughs> and he gets on the phone we're talking about peter michael hamill and everything how much he loves this cat <laughs> and then he invited us to a show in uh, in atlantic city and so we so we went we went to the show and and you know my mother was a big tony bennett fan so i i got an album tony bennett album i got him to autograph it for her <laughs> yeah man i will get yeah right but you're right i see I see your point. As a critic, you know, you don't want to cross the barrier, right? Because then, yeah, yeah. Are they gonna be anybody walk out of one of your interviews? Well, that Brian Eno did. Um, no, but be, no Brian Eno, but the one that you were doing on his own that say, "Man, I don't like the question. You were not prepared. I'm out of here," or whatever. No one's ever said that. The worst one was an opera singer. Yeah. Oh, why am I spacing on her name? I need to come up with it. You you might know it. Vangelis, the Methodia album. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that guy. It was, it was yeah. two, two, two opera singers. Mm -hmm. They're both black opera singers. They're both really big. And 
Oh God, why can't I remember that? Anyway, she was a pain in the ass, man. She she like delayed the. I'm gonna make that story short. She delayed the interview. We had to change locations for the interview. She finally comes into the interview and she wants to see the question. She doesn't like the way I have the microphone set up. She wants to see the questions. I killed that. I never do beforehand. I never never give give questions beforehand. And uh, and I said, well, well, you know, fuck it. I'm here already. Yeah, here's the questions. And she's going through the questions. So like one of them is like, so have you ever did, had you heard the music of Vangelis before? She says, oh, I can't answer that. <laughs> and we finally sit down to do do the interview and I asked the first question I forget what it was and she said I said I wouldn't answer that and I just take my headphones off and said we're done <laughs> and oh god oh, what was her name right before oh, like that what do you think her this is a human me. being is is that that I don't want to Oh, she was just so ego, ego thing. And then, then, and then the next day, I interview Vangelis. This is like a long interview. It's like a ninety-minute interview, and I do have film of that. Oh yeah. Uh, so it was like a ninety-minute interview. It was great. Um, and the interview is done. And someone told me, some, someone from the record label told me this. He goes into the room, and the, the singer calls him up because apparently she had the hots for for Vangelis. And she said, I, in, I was interviewed by this horrible man yesterday. So if he gets off the phone and Vangelis goes to the record company guy, and he says, who is that person who interviewed you know, her yesterday? And he said, well, that was the guy you just spent 90 minutes with. And he says, oh, and he lit up a cigar and just, <laughs> just left. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> that interview that you did with him, I think they went from... 82. The one that I, I emailed you, 82, right? It's unbelievable. I mean, it's unbelievable. For me, it's one of my heroes, right? And uh, the, the question that you asked, very personal, he he elaborate on this question, and you get to know the person. It's, it's, those are great interviews, man. Yeah, that was, that was good. And that was done, I forget if I set that up in the interview, but you know, that was done a day or two after he'd won the Academy Award. Yeah. <laughs> And he was and he was in the studio putting the finishing touches on Blade Runner. My God, man. <laughs> how I, I I'm, I'm that 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 soundtrack, the film score is unbelievable. Uh huh. How talented was that guy, man? Uh, he was. And the thing is, he he does it all live. So I saw him live doing. Yeah. That was the only time I've seen him doing the Methodia in a in yeah. Athens. Yeah. And um. You know, he, he just, the keyboard thing, I went, got, got him behind his keyboard setup, and it was just amazing. Was like a few, a few keyboards, a lot of pedals, um, and, if, it, and he does it all live. I mean, he just sits out. Well, in that interview, I have him playing live, right? Yeah, 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 you did, yeah. And, and, should, and you know, he just, just like whips that out. You know? How in the world somebody can do that, man? No backing tracks, no nothing. He just, just like does it. It's just, it's just amazing. Yeah. The guy was unbelievable, man. Yeah, he, there, he was, there, you go ahead, I'm sorry. No, it's, uh, that's it. There, there people are another level all together, I suppose. That was one of my my heroes, man. And uh, it, uh, feel free to elaborate on, uh, in, on Wendy Carlos. Uh, Wendy's so beautiful. Um, How many times have you have? Have you interviewed her? It's been a lot. It's been a lot. Um, I interviewed her in 82 or 3. Yeah. I interviewed her when Switch on Bach was redone. Yeah. At least five times. Yeah. And I'm kind of in touch with her. Um, yeah. In fact, pe people, people come to me to get to her. She won't do interviews anymore. So I pass these, these requests on to her. You know, I don't give them her information. And and finally, I, and she turns them down. And I finally said, said, when do you want me to just stop sending these to you? And she said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but she's very, very nice. So smart, like ludicrously smart. Yeah. Um, 
and she was and she's into a lot of different things she was into pro tools not pro tools um photoshop before like anybody like that she, her mind is just and she was doing all these weird things on it mm -hmm. um yeah she is she is she is just brilliant underrated as much as famous as she is and as you know influential as we all know she is she's still like underrated for, for what she did yeah but i'm completely with you why so many records are, it's hard to you know i i mean i pay more right so to to buy her stuff and i recently bought a, a lot of several, several albums that um and cd that i don't have from her but it, it there are no many i don't know the the record label that she worked with or used to work that they're they're not putting the music out there it's not that easy to buy her stuff anymore well, she's, I believe she's, I haven't checked very recently, but yeah. she's not on any streaming services, I don't think. No, and the, her website is very, very no. old. No. Her website's old, yeah. No, she, has updated that. And... I talked to her about that, and she just kind of doesn't want to do it. Um, like a, and she doesn't have like a helper that can help her out to. Gosh, I think, I think she doesn't like the concept. I think she doesn't like the concept. She just, you know, and she has control of all her music. She owns all the rights. The music so, rights, right? Yeah. yeah. She so she's the one holding it back, um, and she's very, very. Uh, you know, she's very litigious. I mean, you put up one of her tunes on YouTube, it'll, it'll be down in like an hour because <laughs> she's like, <laughs> she she won't let anybody put stuff up of of her music and. Um, yeah. I got told her. I said, "Man, yeah, your stuff should should be out there. People people want to hear it." Of course, yeah. You're making money off it, and you know, I don't I don't know what her money situation is, but um, yeah, yeah. But she, she where she lives in? She's still in New York, I think. She's still no? she's still still right in right in Manhattan. Yeah, right. Because I mean, there soundtrack like the Clockwork Orange and the Shining and the Throne. There are many bootleg copies out there. I don't know exactly how many are her stuff and and uh, how many are you know somebody else that make her stuff mm -hmm. uh, i i think i saw on the website that yeah uh, last week i went to her website and says please don't buy you know bullet copies of uh <laughs> of guiding or this because i only composed four record four track and that album has took 10 or 12 whatever I'm making this up and so they are not mine and so forth. So it it I mean she's like you say is underrated. I mean you think that you would like to help her out to create create a, a, a better website or be able to somebody else, someone else to promote her music because yeah. she's very good. I mean you want to help. Why she doesn't want to make more money that she's yeah, entitled she's, to. She's not, and I, I, and I think she's in. I think she's not in great health. I mean, she's pretty old now. I forget what her age is, but she's definitely north of eighty. I think eighty-four. I think. Yeah. I um, and I know, no, she's like you know, not you know, she's got just the problems that come when you get up, get up into into your eighties. So yeah, she's, yeah. Hey, I got that opera singer, Kathleen oh. Kathleen Battle. Yeah. No. Okay. Got it. Yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> Kathleen Battle. And after, after, after that, after all that, I started hearing all these jokes about her. Like Kathleen Battle's got a new album out. It, it's a gospel album. Nobody knows the trouble I've caused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well. Yeah. No, I don't. Your name doesn't bring the bell to me. I don't. Bangladesh, you know, we're going back to Bangladesh. But let me let me finish my thought on on um Wendy Carlos. I mean, she's unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. There are there are people at the world at di a different level, you know. It um I don't know. I want to use example Michael Jordan, right? There there were Larry Bear, the Magic Johnson, Dr. J, all the people, but there were people that were one step above. Right. I mean, um, Wendy Carlos or Jean-Michel Jarre or Bangalese of, 
I don't know, my opinion, Lisa Gerard, because I'm biased. Oh, no, Lisa Gerard is. There are people that are a different level, right? There are good people, right? And there are people that, you know. She's on she's on a different level. I've had yeah. I've got some interesting Lisa Gerard stories. I do have a great picture of her. I interviewed her in LA, and this was um for Dead Can Dance Reunion that, that happened. Like so they yes. had been for a while and they got, yeah. they got together. And they saw him at the Hollywood Bowl. And uh, and then I interviewed her in a hotel room, and she's in bed, <laughs> and uh, she's dressed. Um, and I have a picture of her laying in bed with a glass of wine. <laughs> I, I took. <laughs> she is so funny. But she she my first interview with her was the weirdest thing. It was, it was very early. Um, oh, I forget what album it would have been out, but it would have been one of the first American releases. And I think it was their first tour. And uh, I was supposed to interview them both up in New York. She decides she doesn't, she's going to go shopping or something. So Brendan does the interview. And Brendan's a great interview. I don't know if you ever talked to him. No, I have not. He's, yeah, he's he, kind of quiet and shy guy. No, no, he's not shy. He's a, he's a great interview. He's great. a great. So I, so I did the interview with him. You know, yeah. Well, I'm here, right? I'm here. I, I'll do the interview. So I do do the interview. But at the end, Lisa comes in to, to go pick him up and go somewhere. And I just remember I reached across the table with the microphone and I started asking her a ton of questions. And I got just the most amazing answers from her in like five, six minutes. You know, it was but but yeah. then we've had several long interviews since then. She's she's unbelievable, man. She's unbelievable. Is anybody you wish you have interviewed that is not with us, whether you're using your program or not? Uh, I wish I'd interviewed Don Cherry. Yeah. Um, I would have liked to have interviewed Hendrix. I think no good interviews with Hendrix. Yeah. And he was interviewed a fair amount, not a ton really, when he yeah. was here. But he was only here for three years in terms of, you know, yeah. his thing. Um, but there are no good interviews with him, um, which is surprising. Uh, yeah, you know. I don't was, know if you like Dave Sylvian or, of course, or well, David Bowie or, or people like David that. David Sylvian several times. Interviewed Moby. Wow. Interviewed me several times. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, no, I've, been, I've, interviewed, I've interviewed everybody. There's nobody left. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see us. I need to. I need to. I need to go to your house, John, and then look at your archive. Look at the warehouse that you have. I need to listen to stuff, man. <laughs> but there's always new people, you know. There's always new people. Are you digging into the stuff on the sign label out of Germany? No. Oh, you should take out. Well, first, the, 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 there's an artist on the label called Sign. A sign like Sign Wave. Yeah. So there's an artist called Sime, Thomas Thomas Hauser, and then there's Thomas Lemmer, who is very prolific. He's putting out a ton of stuff. You might you might dig it. It's kind of, it's kind of chill. Yeah, all, all electronic, really good. So I, it's the Sign Music label. They're very good and they're a nice guy. Um, who who else? Um, there's down tempo artist Vandalux. I've been into him. Did you hear the new Holland Holmes album? Uh, yeah, it came out Friday, right? Yeah, Sacred Places. Very yeah. good. Very it's good. good I, I'm going to be interviewing him um, Monday next week. Oh, cool. He's a nice interview. He's, He's a very him, nice person. Yeah, tell him I said hello, and I really well. dig the album. Uh, There's this artist, Evening Ocean. I actually consulted him on, on his new album, um, The Great Love. That's pretty cool. Um, Akira Kawasara. I said that wrong. Akira Kos Kosamura. Akira Kosamura. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of new stuff coming out. A lot of new artists. There's always new artists. And, you know, sometimes they're the most interesting people to interview, you know? Yeah. Um, Everybody want to go look back to 
all the big name, but there are like you say, it's a lot yeah, of great people coming. Yeah, is this new? That, that's you know that that my I mean echoes is like I would say it's eighty five percent music that's come out in the last six months. You know. And then we'll throw in a track, you know, an old thing. I played Steve Hillage Rainbow Dome music recently. Yeah, which I haven't played in a long time. Uh, so we'll we'll throw throw in some old tracks, but it is about eighty five percent new music. And it could be old artists doing new music, like Xano. Old artists, right? Yeah. That's right. You know, Jean Michel Jarre. Uh, you know, we're playing stuff from his uh, Oxymore reworks right now, yeah. uh, or is it Oxymore works? Oxymore works. Um, so you know we'll, we'll play them. He's been on the you, show. You interview him, right? Met several times. Yeah. And what about Mike Oldfield? Have you interviewed? Several times. My gosh, <laughs> man! man I, and I have a very humble channel, man. And you know, compared to the old interview you have Mike, done, Mike Oldfield, he's, he's he's a good interview. He's he's a, he's a good interview. He's kind of he's a little little shy, reticent, but yeah. uh, I remember um, I have interviewed. I've interviewed him. One of the times was um, he'd done Tubular Bells. It was where he re-recorded Tubular Bells. Yeah. So two, 2003 or something like that. Yeah, he did the two, the three, the four. and Yeah, no, but this is actually he re-recorded it. Oh, uh, he got okay. yeah, yeah. He, he, he said, he said I, I call it Tubular Bells in tune and in time. Oh, okay. Because the other one had a lot of, you know, timing issues and stuff. Cause That's right, yeah. Pretty primitive. Which I think is the charm of it, actually. But he, but I sat in his studio and listened to the surround version with his giant speakers and stuff of this new tubular bells. It was like fucking amazing, you know. <laughs> and you, you have you you don't have you don't have picture of any of those, right? Oh yeah, I do. Oh, you do? Do. Yeah, we started doing pictures about them. We we figured, oh yeah, shit, we should be doing pictures of all these people. Yeah. So I think the last time I interviewed him was when uh. The the um the he redid Omadon, yeah, yeah. I, I need to, that was that was like this. That was a remote interview though. He's in the Bahamas now. Yeah, he's in the. I interview his brother. I'm Derry? going to be, huh? Gary. Yeah, and then uh, I'm going to be interviewing, hopefully, um, his sister, ah. and, uh, and uh, you know Sally and. Uh, uh, but he 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 doesn't give interviews. He wanna he's keeping to himself nowadays. He in the Bahamas, quiet, low profile. He doesn't want to fame. Plus, at the same time, you know, I'm not as big as you are, right? So I have a couple online radios, uh, my humble YouTube channel, so I can now get a hold of um, a lot of people that I would love to interview and. Uh, and uh so i'm i'm working different strategies to get a hold of certain folks because as i said before it i i need to do it i it's a personal goal of mine no 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 an ego thing john um like a good example would be i don't know like david sylvan or, or robert fripp right um two one percent of me will say man great i accomplished that goal i interviewed this guy uh you know him or her whatever but the 99 percent will be that i will put the interview on facebook or on on the youtube channel and a lot of people will see the interview and that make me happy john uh believe me it's not an ego thing it's not plus i told you before i'm not doing for the money or not so i i i would make a lot of people happy and i will be you know, happy that I talked to a guy that I was chasing down for many, many years, right? Or Wendy Carlo would be another one, or whatever, whatever, you know. So, um, so it's, uh, you know, probably I will never be able to interview all of them, but I have a long way to go, and I'm a stubborn, I'm persistent, consistent, so I will keep on bothering people until they say yes. You going to do you a know. book? Huh? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, bro, I will... Um, I think you. I can think you have the energy to do it. Like you sound like you have the energy to do it. Uh, yeah. I uh, a, a couple, a couple people ask me if I will pick the best, a hundred interview and do them, but I wouldn't write the book. I do do the transcript, right? Take audio, mm. but you know, pass into a tool to, to, and then have somebody edit my English or, 
you know, or, or you put a nice cover and some picture and uh, yeah, probably, but no, no, I, I don't have the time to like you, you know, write like a real book, but uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, being able to talk to people that you admire, being able to talk to, you know, Fox or a man or that you put a record 40 years ago, whatever, 50 years ago, that that's an unbelievable experience for me, man. Yeah. That's what it can be pressure satisfaction, man. Hey, John, we've been talking to like an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> well, hey, we, we're both we're both music nuts, so we could probably be talking the whole day. We need, we need we need to we need to do uh, we need to do a part two and part three and. Uh, well, we need to get together next time you come up for a gatherings or something. Yeah, you know, let let, let me know. I think they have some stuff scheduled. I haven't. Uh, I can't remember what they have, but I think they do have some stuff coming. Um. <laughs> So, you try to attend all of them or, or i you know i don't go to as many as i should to be honest with you i'll tell you again i admire you because you make that trek for me you know it, it could be an hour and a half it should be 45 minutes to get into philadelphia from where i live but it's usually an hour and a half <laughs> yeah, definitely. you know and so it's like well i do i want to do that oh man it's like sometimes and a lot of times a lot of the artists you know they will have just played for me because usually when when artists come in they'll do an echoes performance it's like Ian yeah. the last time he was there he right. did an echoes performance and so i kind of saw him but you know what it's not the same it's not the same um the con the concert experience is something you know that i i really love and uh yeah i'll be going to my first one in a little while on a, a california guitar trio Oh yeah, they're very, very good, man. Yeah. yeah, we're recording them Thursday morning, and then I'll see them Thursday night when they play out at Sellersville Theater. Uh, this this coming Thursday, yeah, yeah. Thursday eighteenth, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good for you, man. <laughs> they're, they're they're very good for you. How many calls do you see a year? You go to a lot of shows. Not as many as you would think. You, it, really? Much less. Much less. It, it's I don't know, maybe twenty. A year, right? Yeah, I, that's and that's another thing. I should have kept a list of my concerts. I've been trying to reconstruct all the concerts I've been to. It's very hard to do, um, because I've been to, I've been to so many. But I used to go to concerts like all the time. I mean, I'd be going to a couple a week. Yeah, you can see Philadelphia, yeah. especially before COVID. It's, it's changed since COVID. Before COVID. Mm -hmm the music that we like there used yep. to be a lot, of the, a lot of those shows in philadelphia i mean just a lot of them and uh and i would be going to a couple of shows a week easy and um and since covid there's been less of those artists coming through mm -hmm. uh, not sure not sure why uh because you know i mean things are relatively back to normal yeah there's still covid is picking up here oh don't tell me Someone, yeah, was, someone, someone in my house just just got over it. Fortunately, they got it light, but it was still like, oh shit! Now he's got it. We can't go anywhere, you know. <laughs> yeah, man, we live in crazy time, John. Man, he yeah. music is healing, but of and plus, you know, probably Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia. As yeah. a hum human, human society, human being, maybe maybe we are doomed, man. I oh, we're know. definitely doomed. You know. We're What's that Van de Graaff Generator album? Uh, we're all awash in a sea of blood. The least we can do is wave to each other. <laughs> yeah, that's the first statement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, it's true, man. Man, I, I want peace in the world with music. We'll be able to see concert. You know, hopefully the problems of the world will, I don't know. I'm, I'm optimistic. will disappear and people will make peace, man. We are, we are crazy as human beings, man. Yeah. Hey, I got to ask you a question. I'm looking at yep. your bookshelf. Yep. Back there, and on the right hand side. Yep. Is that black and white? Is that is that Thelonious Monk? Uh, the, over there. Yeah. Um, show me. Let me know. This is this is Phil Collins. It's Phil this Collins. Is Waters, and that's an album from uh, Genesis. Okay. No, no picture. And uh, huh. man, so I have, I have uh, this, 
this time I need to listen to Come in order. Uh, why are you doing vinyl, Claudio? Uh, at this time, I need to listen to. Why? Why? Why are you doing vinyl? I I buy a lot of vinyl. Uh, wow. My vinyl. Have you moved? Have you moved much? Uh, no. We own this house. We were ninety five. No, I'm sorry. Two. What I'm saying? Twenty fifteen. Twenty fifteen. So ten. Nine years. Uh, and, uh, You're going to regret having all that vinyl when you have to move. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Part of my life. <laughs> you know, I buy at least, at least 50, at least, um, um, at least 50 a month. Oof. And then uh, overall, my music collection is about 10,000 between CDs, vinyl. And Blu ray. I, I, I have Blu rays, I have like 700. Yeah. I have upstairs in every room that I have here. I have a, a, a nice stereo. I have Edmo, Atmos and 5.1. I mean, I'm a music nut, man. And uh, for me, I like to buy stuff. I mean, I. it's important. You know, I like you, John, I don't want to be 85 one day saying, man, why didn't see the band? Why didn't see the Pesh Mode, dude? Or Peter Gabriel, Genesis, or this, or no, no, no. I, I need to, I have a good salary. I do a lot of stuff outside work and uh, I want to enjoy myself. And I don't, I don't want to live with regrets, you know, so. Well, that's good. That's good. I've, I've kind of gotten over FOMO for that yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like, you know. Yeah. But uh, no, I don't know. I, I need, vinyls are good then. Ah. CDs are good. Blu-rays are good. Everything is good then. All right, man. All right, John. It was very nice talking to you, man. Good, 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 good. Great talking to you. Let me know when you, when you put this up. I'm going to yep, send you that picture. Yeah, you bet. And then we'll we'll definitely get together, man. I need so, to convince you to issue around for you to put the, the interview somewhere <laughs> because I want to listen to all of them, man. So just just another aside. Yes. So the Kathleen battle. So I looked that up while you and I were talking. Yeah. You know how I looked it up. Con controversial Met Opera singer. She was the first one that came up. <laughs> what, what? Man, you you know, what kind of what people are like that? I don't understand. <laughs> the people, the egos, the I don't know. Yeah, there are people, they are arrogant people in all profession. Yeah. You know, you know the, most most oh, yeah, musicians yeah, yeah. I've interviewed have been great. I've yeah. got to say. Mo mo I, most of them have just been really nice people. There have been very few that have had attitudes. Um, Peter Bauman did throw me out of the Tangerine Dream locker room. Uh, um, um, you know, they were their um, backstage room uh, on their first tour. <laughs> but other than that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Peter Bauman is living, he's in real estate now. I think he lives in California, Los Angeles. Or... I think he's in New Mexico. Huh? I think he's in New Mexico. Oh. oh, he might be in San Francisco. No, San Francisco. He's, he's he owns like a, a kind of real estate or properties management company, something related yeah. to that. Yeah, he's a business guy. Yeah, but he was good though. Yeah, he was good. He was good. Yeah. I like this. Some... No, I like the Noyland thing he did. And, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, no, no, he's a few problems again. I interviewed him later. He's very, very nice. Yeah, he's a good guy. Okay, John. Thank you. Thanks again, man. All right, man. Take care. Thank you, Touchman. Appreciate it. Thank you. We'll see each other All right. very soon. Bye. <laughs>